I, hopefully this clicker works. So we're gonna talk about the code stroke process, um, a little bit of a tangent on the NIH because we use it so frequently. And there are a little, um, you know, some quirks with the NIH that we don't always think of. I have no disclosures. So the objectives are to identify indications for calling a code stroke. Uh, this is one of the most important things as nurses, you guys are with the patients more than anybody. Um, so extremely helpful to initiating the process. Understanding the responsibility of the RN in the code stroke process, um, noting that there are different scales. Um, obviously we stick to certain ones at our facility, but there are many out there. And then discussing some of the pearls and pitfalls of the NIH. So we're gonna talk about a patient. She's a 69 year old female. She has a past medical history of hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia. EMS was called to her house for confusion. Uh, a lot of people that do neuro a lot know that confusion can mean a lot of things. Uh, so when they got there, they noticed that she had a left gaze preference, was nonverbal, and had right-sided weakness. Family last saw the patient in her usual state of health the evening prior. Uh, this is extremely important that, you know, from EMS to nursing to anybody that's talking with family or loved ones, um, caregivers, to know when the patient was normal. Um, not when they found them. Uh, while that's important, we really want to know when the patient was last seen completely normal. So EMS radios to the ER, uh, the stroke alert is activated in the field, which gives uh, the hospital team a chance to be prepared. So you'll hear often the LAM score, that's, there's also multiple um, pre-hospital scales, but a LAM score is the Los Angeles motor scale. It's very basic, pretty simple. Um, when EMS calls in, we'll get a LAM score on a patient. Having a LAM score of zero doesn't mean that you are not having a stroke and having a LAM score of five doesn't mean that you are having a stroke, but it does kind of help guide you and especially get the team ready and aware. So for our patient, she's a LAM score of three. Um, she has weakness in the face, weakness in the arm, and weakness um, in her grip strength. So when she arrives to the ER, the team's ready, seen by a physician, uh, and a code stroke is called. Uh, just important to note, this is when EMS comes in. There's triage nurses, if, I don't know if there are any in here, that are, play a really vital role also when patients walk into the ER in recognizing the symptoms of a, of a stroke. Also bedside nursing uh, for inpatient code strokes, uh, the nurses are the first people that, that see the patient oftentimes noticing that there's a difference. So BFAST is on here. We've talked about it a couple of times today. I don't think I need to go over that. Um, and then of course the NIH scale is also an important scale for us when we're recognizing a code stroke. So the NIH stroke scale, it's the gold standard for stroke severity rating uh, since about 1995. There's been multiple versions and it's been redone uh, and it was developed initially for research purposes. So it can predict outcomes uh, and it can help predict the uh, presence of a large vessel occlusion. The scale itself was designed to be reproducible, um, which as we know as clinicians is sometimes easier said than done and can change uh, rapidly and it should be completed for all suspected strokes. So some of the downsides, it wasn't necessarily meant for bedside neurologic exam. It doesn't replace a bedside neurologic exam either. Uh, it requires trained personnel, especially for reproducibility. And of course it's affected by cooperability of patients as anyone who's worked with stroke patients has seen. Uh, it doesn't reflect overall cognition, uh, distal motor function, cortical sensory function, and then gait impairment. So there's a lot of pieces uh, that are not covered by the NIH scale. So very basic rules. You score what you see, not what you think. Use the first response from the patient and do not coach the patient. I think we see coaching the most probably um, when we're trying to get people to follow commands or see if they're following commands. It's hard not to show them what to do. Uh, but certainly you don't want them to be mimicking what you're doing. You want them to have a, a true response of, of being able to follow commands. Um, so these slides are gonna look busy because they're all the details about each of the components of the NIH. Um, the first three components, 1A, 1B, 1C, are all level of consciousness related. Uh, and so that involves, is the patient alert? Are they able to answer the questions? Uh, and are they following commands? Again, like I said, with commands, we want the patient to truly follow, not be mimicking or being coached to follow. Um, same goes with answering questions. So for our patient, um, she's not alert, but she's arousable. She answers neither question correctly. If you remember, she's nonverbal. So she scores a two for that. And she performs neither task. 
The second component is gaze. Uh, for our patient, she has a forced gaze to the left. Uh, if the patient was able to at least attempt to come to midline, to cross midline, but go back to the left, we could give her a one. And then of course, a normal gaze would be midline gaze that can cross in both directions without difficulty. Um, in the NIH scale, you only test for a horizontal gaze. Visual fields can be a little complicated, especially with people who are either uncooperative, altered, um, aphasic. So you sometimes have to be a little creative with that. Ideally, you um, have somebody look in the center of your face and have them count fingers peripherally. Uh, alternatives to that are blinking to threat, um, you know, confronting the, that side with your hand. And if they blink regularly, then uh, it's suspected that they have vision there. If they're not blinking on the other side, then um, you would suspect that there's visual field loss. So for our patient, she scores a two. Facial palsy is next. Um, I think everybody's very familiar with the facial droop. Uh, you are assessing um, upper and lower. Uh, with stroke, we tend to see involvement with the lower part of the face, um, but it's important to do the full assessment. So for our patient, she scores a two on this as well. Motor response, also pretty self-explanatory, um, having the patient lift up their arms, um, palms up, 10 seconds. Uh, with their eyes closed to see if they drift down to the bed or if they have any effort against gravity. In patients who are uncooperative, you may have to use painful stimuli to see if they can move that extremity. Um, so for our patient and her, we're talking about her right arm, of course you do the right and left, um, all extremities. So she has some effort against gravity on the right. Um, the left is ineffective and purposeful. And then she has no um, effort against gravity in her leg. Ataxia um, is when you've seen it and it's a, a real ataxia exam is, is fairly distinct. Um, the tricky part about that is, is it per, out of proportion to the weakness if the patient has weakness in the arm or leg? Um, so that's kind of the gray area with ataxia. Um, doing the finger to nose uh, and the heel to shin are how we test for that. Uh, since our, just to mention, since our patients uh, pretty weak on the right side. She does not score anything for ataxia. Sensory, again, you may have to involve painful stimuli in the aphasic patient or the patient that's not cooperative or not able to tell you um, if sensation's equal on both sides, but pretty straightforward overall. So she scores a one for that. Language, of course, can be rather difficult, especially with the language barrier. Um, when we're testing for aphasia, uh, we have people name objects, explain what's going on in the picture, uh, repeating phrases. Um, and so essentially our patient's mute. She's not able to do any of these things. So she immediately scores a three. Dysarthria, um, she, she's mute, not speaking, um, but she's, it's part of the NIH scale. If you read through the little pieces that she scores a two for that. Um, other patients, when you're talking to them, you can really assess it in any conversation, but having them repeat phrases, having them um, repeat the words uh, from the NIH scale, and you can es essentially assess if they have slurred speech. Extinction is a little bit tricky. Um, visual extinction, you can test um, double simultaneous stimulation when you're doing visual fields, holding a finger up on both sides to see if they're seeing one or both um, as a form of visual neglect. And then of course, um, when you're testing in the extremities, if they feel left, right, both, um, those who have strokes at, at times, when you're touching both sides, will only feel their, uh, their good side. So her total is 23. So I think we can all kind of see where this is going. So essentially back to the ER management. So we did our NIH, our goal to get to the CAT scanners less than 20 minutes, which I feel like at our facility, we're very good at. We have the CAT scan right there. Uh, from a nursing standpoint, Point, really important things to have, blood pressure and vitals. Um, this patient's not a candidate for TPA. We already talked about that she was last normal the night before. However, if a patient's a TPA candidate and their blood pressure is 220, it already has you triggering, you know, we need to get antihypertensives on board uh, if, if we're going to be giving TPA. Also, um, getting a weight on the patient, a, an accurate weight, not a guess or not what the family says, getting a weight on the bed, having a large bore IV, glucose on every single patient, and then if you're able to send labs, but of course the priority is getting the CAT scan done. Um, a really big part, especially from nursing, or like I said, whoever's in contact with EMS or with family uh, is getting information. 
We talked about last no normal and what that means. Um, definitely the most important piece of information when you're determining if somebody's a TPA candidate. Uh, you know, if somebody was found at, at 8 a.m. or if the it may be reported that the patient was normal at 8 a.m. and specifically asking were they found then or was that when they were seen normal. Um, we get a lot of people in the morning who haven't been seen since the night before, but sometimes people can report the, the time they were found, not when they were normal. So that's really important to clarify. If they're taking any anticoagulants, pharmacy is usually really helpful during the day, but uh, we don't have a pharmacist 24 hours uh, to help us check up on this. So asking EMS, with, you know, did they look at medications? Does anybody know if these patients are on anticoagulants? Recent surgery or trauma and a history of hemorrhage, particularly um, ICH. A lot of these, like I said, are really important for TPA candidates, but important overall. And then contact information for family uh, may seem insignificant, but a lot of times we're desperately trying to get a hold of family members. Uh, so if EMS has a number, if you can find a number in the chart, that's all very helpful information. So our patient went and got her what we would call dry CT, her CAT scan without contrast. We're looking for hemorrhage. We're looking for any acute abnormality that could explain the neurologic change. So for her, we don't see anything and proceed on with a CTA. So this is her CTA. Um, you can see, as my colleague Daniel would say, the spaghettis are not equal on both sides. So uh, the, in the, on the CAT scan, I'm sure everybody here knows this, but the left side of the CAT scan is the right side of the brain, the right side of the CAT scan is the left side. So she has a blockage on the left side. You can see where it just very distinctly cuts off. So next, and Ellery talked about this quite a bit, um, essentially the CT perfusion is really helpful for us when we're trying to determine if we're gonna go for endovascular intervention. You have on the left side, the core infarct or the infarcted tissue, the tissue that we can't get back and then the penumbra on the right, uh, and that's the at-risk tissue. That's the, the portion of the brain that we're trying to save. It's calculated in volume, so you can see it. Well, I don't know if you can see at the bottom, it's pretty tiny, but uh, it's 44 mLs for the core infarct, 177 for the penumbra. So we have a 133 mL mismatch, which is a lot of tissue that could be saved. So endovascular intervention is a treatment for large vessel occlusion. The goal is to get to puncture in less than 60 minutes. Um, the, there's many trials, as Ellery had mentioned. Mr. Clean was one in 2015 that showed uh, that these patients significantly had improved outcomes at 90 days when compared to TPA alone uh, without a difference in ICH rate. So proving to be an effective treatment and one that didn't increase risk of um, hemorrhage. So just to recap, the purpose of the code stroke is to expedite patients who are eligible for thrombolytic therapy as well as endovascular intervention. The RN role is extremely important. Um, you guys, like I said, you're the bedside. You see the patient more than we do. Uh, extremely helpful to identify the symptoms of a stroke, the most important thing. And you know, just like Dr. Effendi had discussed, the Q1 hour neuro exams are, as we know, very, very difficult and challenging for you and the patients, but important you know, in an inpatient setting as well to be able to identify when something's changed. Gathering the appropriate information um, for when the team arrives, um, having the IV access, transport monitoring, and then also being comfortable or familiar with mixing TPA, administering TPA, or knowing who on your unit is comfortable with that. Um, so those are all the really important things. I have references. I was supposed to be last, so I was excited to introduce the reception, but you have to wait a little bit longer. <laughs> That's all. Does anybody have questions?